Welcome back to another installment of Space This Week, the Monday show in which we cover all things space that happened this week and last week. But Space This Week and also Last Week doesn't sound as catchy a title, so here we are, I guess. Anyway, so much to discuss. From rocket launches to the incredible success of Starship SN15, let's just get on with it and swiftly commence our first segment, all the top news regarding SpaceX's Starship that happened last week. I mean, you guys have all seen it by now. Do I even need to bother mentioning it? You know, that's right. There were some horses by Starbase. Ooh. Oh, yeah. And um, SN15 launched as well, I guess. That was cool. Nah, I kid, of course. SN15, the latest completed Starship prototype sporting many upgrades over its predecessors, launched into the lightly foggy skies on the 5th of May 2021. The flight proceeded as nominally as the SN8s, 9s, 10s and 11s flights, and we were all waiting with bated breath to see if this vehicle could do the seemingly impossible. Land in one piece. And I guess stay in one piece too. F's in chat for SN10. Amazingly, it did it! It landed with two of its raptors burning a very not green colour, indicating that they weren't actively destroying themselves, like you could see in this footage of SN8, but were instead performing nominally. And moments later, the massive vehicle touched down successfully, with nary a bounce in sight, as was the case with the doomed SN10. A small fire broke out near the base in a similar fashion to SN10, though this was extinguished by the automatic fire suppression system... Uh, eventually. <laughs> With this massive success done and done, SpaceX is now considering flying SN15 a second time. On the one hand, it'd be nice to see it immortalised in a museum, but this is the time for rapid testing, and if it pulls off a second flight, then this would be the first successful reflight of a Starship prototype since Starhopper. Provided you don't include SN10, of course. <laughs> Elsewhere on Starbase, Starship SN16 is undergoing the final stages of assembly in the high bay, before hopefully it too makes a successful flight in the footsteps of SN15, and I'm sure SN17 won't be too far behind either. SN18 through 22 are all well underway with construction as well. The key vehicle to watch right now, aside from obviously the prospect of 15 flying again, is SN20, which is still expected to be the first Starship prototype to attempt orbital flight atop the super heavy prototype BN3, which is still being constructed as we speak. I know that Brendan's latest excellent diagram appears to indicate that the BN3 is further along production than the BN2 and BN2.1, but these diagrams are only assembled based on what has been witnessed by various Boca Chica site watchers and enthusiasts. There may well be more components for BN2 and BN2.1 inside tents and whatnot that just haven't been seen. Although, having said that, one would expect more of BN2.1's parts to have been identified by now, so this is quite a curious vehicle to watch at the moment. We don't really know what's up with the BN2 series right now. It's beginning to look like BN2 will only be a test tank like the SN7 series, and BN2.1 remains a bit of an enigma. Speculation was that it was going to be the first full-scale super heavy test vehicle to perform engine tests and hops, but aside from a dome piece with the label B2.1, no further parts have been seen, so it's not clear what SpaceX are doing with the BN2 line. On the 30th of March, Elon Musk tweeted that the BN2 might even be orbital capable, so either SpaceX have already altered their plans, or more of the vehicle really is just hiding away in some tent somewhere. My guess is that it's probably been scrapped, but it's definitely the most peculiar vehicle to keep a watch on at the moment. What are your thoughts on it? I'd love to hear them in the comments below so that I can plagiarise, I mean be inspired by them, when discussing things next week, when hopefully we'll have some more information and some more components may have been spotted on what exactly is going on with the Super Heavy line. And remember, in order to ensure you don't miss our ongoing coverage of Starship, and I guess space as a whole, <laughs> remember to hit subscribe down below. These episodes come out every Monday, and given the rapid development of the space industry, they're really best viewed on the day of upload, so subscribing and ringing the bell helps ensure you're getting the most out of these videos, and are getting the freshest news possible delivered to you. And I think that's a nice bow on this week's Starship development updates, although last week was incredible to watch, with SN15 nailing the landing, I'm confident that we haven't even come remotely close to the 
of really cool stuff. I'm counting down the seconds to SN20 and BN3, provided that SpaceX still plan to fly this dynamic duo to orbit, though given the mysteries surrounding BN2, it's really anyone's guess what the plan is at this point. Maybe Jeff should just file a lawsuit requesting SpaceX to tell us what's really going on with the Super Heavy prototypes, eh? <laughs> anyway, with Starship news wrapped, let's take a look at what else was going on in the space industry last week. Last week we had three great launches, the first was on Star Wars Day, May the 4th, when SpaceX launched their latest Starlink mission aboard a Falcon 9 rocket from the Kennedy Space Center. As per usual, the Falcon 9 rocket delivered 60 more satellites to SpaceX's rapidly growing satellite internet mega constellation, and the rocket's first stage successfully landed 632 kilometers downrange on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship. The fairing halves were recovered from the water about 50 kilometers further down from the drone ship by SpaceX's recovery vessel Sheila aboard along. The active fairing half used for this mission is pretty special, as this flight marked SpaceX's fastest ever turnaround for fairing reuse, with this flight taking place just 41 days after the active fairing half's previous outing. This was also the second time SpaceX have reflown a Falcon 9 first stage nine times in a row, and with the successful landing of this booster, I'm sure it won't be too long before it breaks double figures. Somehow though, I don't think it'll be the first booster to make 10 flights foreshadowing to later in the video maybe. <laughs> the next launch of the week was on the 6th of May and was a Long March 2C, carrying three Yegen 30 Chinese reconnaissance satellites. It launched from the Zichang Satellite Launch Center in China, and the three Yegens were successfully deployed to low Earth orbit. Also along for the ride was a Tianqi-12 CubeSat for the Internet of Things, which is also now operational in low Earth orbit. The final orbital launch was on the 9th of May and was another Starlink mission, but this one I'd say was even more significant than the last. The flight itself was fairly unremarkable, another 60 satellites were deployed to a 550 km Earth orbit, and the first stage landed 613 km downrange on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship. However, this particular Falcon 9 first stage was B1051, and this was its 10th flight overall, making this SpaceX's actually the entire world's first time to refly an orbital class rocket 10 times. I wonder if it'll ever make it to 20. After all, it's been recovered and is en route back to base, so we will hopefully get a few more flights out of the old girl yet. Over on the red planet now, Ingenuity made its fifth successful flight on the 7th of May. This was the first time the little helicopter took off without returning to its initial takeoff site. Instead, it traveled just over 100 meters southward to land at a new location. This ended the technology demonstration phase of the Ingenuity mission, and so NASA will now try to begin new operations that'll see the Ingenuity actively assist the Perseverance mission. Although the little fellow was only meant to survive for about a month, so we really don't know how long it'll keep running. Or or flying, I guess, would be a better verb to use there. <laughs> the sixth flight date hasn't been confirmed yet, but NASA has stated that they plan to fly the Ingenuity every two to three weeks until the end of August. Time will tell how the Ingenuity fares, though given that it's already gone above and beyond all of our expectations, hopefully it'll keep on impressing us. Anyway, all of that stuff and all of the Starship news makes last week a very exciting one for space enthusiasts, but that's not to say that next week won't be exciting too. Let's take a look at what's in store. Today, on the 10th of May, the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft will depart from asteroid Bennu and begin its long journey back to Earth. This is quite an exciting mission. OSIRIS-REx is a NASA asteroid study and sample return mission. Its main goal, acquiring a sample from the surface of asteroid 101955 Bennu, was completed on the 20th of October, a feat we covered on Space This Week in fact, and it'll now begin the trip home. Once the spacecraft gets close to Earth, it'll deploy the sample return capsule, which will parachute shoot down to the surface for recovery, expected on the 24th of September 2023, seven years after the mission launched. This will be the first American spacecraft to return asteroid samples to Earth, and the material returned is expected to provide scientists with valuable information about the formation and evolution of the solar system, its initial stages of planet formation, and the source of organic compounds that led to the formation of life on Earth. Bennu is considered a primitive asteroid in that it has undergone a little geological change since it was first formed, hence how it can serve as a sort of time capsule to the early solar system. Good luck to NASA on this next crucial 
initial phase of the mission. On the 15th of May, Rocket Lab will launch their next Electron mission, titled Running Out of Toes. On board will be two Black Sky Earth observation satellites for Black Sky Global, which will be deployed to a low Earth orbit. This particular launch of the Electron rocket itself will be a rather special one, not only because it'll be once again launching from my favorite launch pad ever, aside from this bad boy of course, the BEA beautiful Mahia Peninsula in New Zealand, but this will also be Rocket Lab's second ever attempt at first stage recovery. The booster will soft land in the ocean via parachute, and this will serve Rocket Lab's ongoing research into making Electron's first stage reusable. At this point, this is all still quite early phase development. Long term, the company plans on catching the falling booster mid-parachute descent using a helicopter. Sounds bonkers, I know, but this is a capability they've actually already demonstrated during testing last year, so it's not quite as bizarre as it might seem. It's not been made completely clear if Rocket Lab plan on reflying or re-engine testing this week's Electron first stage again, or if it'll be dissected and examined like their previous recovered booster. Only time will tell, I suppose. Reusability is something that Rocket Lab are very determined to achieve, with their next plan rocket design, the much larger Neutron, sporting very Falcon 9-esque looking landing legs. Always good to see some competition in the space industry, so I'm sure you can all join me in wishing Rocket Lab the very best of luck with this week's launch. 12 hours after the Electron, on the 15th of May still, will be another rocket launch with first stage recovery. This will be a slightly more familiar sight though, another Falcon 9 Starlink mission. The Falcon 9 first stage is expected to land on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship, and the upper stage will once again deploy 60 Starlink satellites to low Earth orbit. Electron and Falcon 9 are the only confirmed orbital launches next week, but we do have some suborbital flights to look forward to as well. The first will be on the 10th of May and will be a Black Brand 12A, a four-stage sounding rocket that'll carry plasma science experiments to the edge of space on behalf of the University of Alaska Fairbanks. It will launch from the Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia. It's not the only sounding rocket launch from Wallops on the 10th of May though. On the same day, a smaller two-stage Terrier Malamut sounding rocket will launch a scientific payload investigating ionosphere spheric propagation on behalf of the University of Berkeley. The final suborbital launch of the week is expected on the 14th of May and will be the new crewed spaceflight attempt of Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2 and VSS Unity. The first attempt was made in December 2020, but this was aborted before the space plane made it uh, anywhere really, and instead it glided back to the runway. Hopefully this attempt gets a little bit further. Virgin Galactic Spaceship Series will be used, at least in one of its primary configurations, as a space tourism vehicle. This puts it in quite the competitive position with Blue Origin's new Shepard rocket, which will perform a similar mission profile of a fully reusable two-stage system that'll send passengers to the edge of space and back again. Of the two vehicles, which would you fly in? And which kidney would you sell to afford the ticket price, I guess would be an appropriate follow-up question. I guess competition is good, and hopefully one day even us peasants can afford a seat in one of these vehicles. By the way, please donate to my Patreon and join my channel membership program. Completely unrelated request, I promise. <laughs> anyway, that's a wrap on my summary of next week's space activities, but of course, there's still one topic I'm yet to cover. All the best anniversaries that'll take place this week, so let's do that now. On this day, the 10th of May, oh that was fun, in 1946, the United States launched the first successful American V-2 rocket from the White Sands missile range. The V-2 was originally designed as a Nazi weapon used to destroy Allied targets during the last two years of the Second World War, but the United States captured and transported some 100 V-2s back to the United States, also recruiting prominent German scientists and engineers, most notably Werner von Braun, to work for the United States military. The V-2 was repurposed by the US as a sounding rocket to carry scientific instruments into the Earth's upper atmosphere, and the launch on the 10th of May was the second American V-2 launch overall. The first failed after a failure with one of the rocket's fins and a loss of radio contact. The American V-2s would go on to pave the way for American manned space exploration and would give rise to rockets such as the Redstone, a direct descendant of the V-2, and the rocket that would put the first ever American in space. On May the 14th, we have a couple of space station anniversaries. The first is the 1973 launch of Skylab, the United States' first space station. 
This would also be the final launch of the legendary Saturn V rocket, which to date remains the tallest, heaviest and most powerful rocket ever brought to operational status. Of course, this launch it flew without the third stage, lunar module or command and service module, instead carrying the Skylab to low Earth orbit. Skylab was occupied for about 24 weeks overall, between May 1973 and February 1974, and was operated by three separate three astronaut crews which visited the station via an Apollo spacecraft. These were missions Skylab 2, Skylab 3 and Skylab 4. Unfortunately, Skylab's orbit decayed such that it would need to be reboosted by the space shuttle by mid-1979. However, the Columbia wouldn't be ready until 1981, and so on the 11th of July 1979, Skylab re-entered and disintegrated in the atmosphere, scattering debris across the Indian Ocean and Western Australia. The other space station anniversary for the 10th of May is the 2010 launch of Space Shuttle Atlantis, which delivered the first ever shuttle-launched Russian component for the International Space Station, the RASFET module. This was also supposed to be the last ever flight for Atlantis, but then Congress approved STS-135, which would not only be the final launch of Atlantis, but the final ever space shuttle mission overall. On the 15th of May, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik 3 and Sputnik 4, though in different years, Sputnik 3 in 1958 and Sputnik 4 in 1960. Sputnik 3 was an automatic scientific satellite carrying 12 scientific instruments powered by solar cells and batteries that operated the spacecraft for about six weeks. The spacecraft would remain in orbit for 692 days in total before burning up in April 1960. Sputnik 4 was a little bit bigger than Sputnik 3. It was the first test of the Vostok spacecraft ahead of the very first ever human spaceflight, Vostok 1, which of course carried Yuri Gagarin to space in one of the most legendary flights in space history. Sputnik 4 contained some scientific instruments, a television system, and a mannequin to represent a human cosmonaut. Keeping to the subject of early test flights, and also on the 15th of May again, this time in 1963, the final Mercury mission, Mercury Atlas 9, was launched with astronaut Gordon Cooper on board. He became the first American to spend a full day in space, and given that all preceding American space vehicles had more than one seat, he was the last American to fly in space alone. Would you believe it now? There's another anniversary for May the 15th, this time 1987, when the Soviet Union conducted the first ever launch of the massive Energia Super Heavy Lift vehicle. While probably best known as the rocket that launched the Soviet shuttle Buran, the Energia was also a fully functional standalone rocket in its own right. On this launch, it carried the Polyus spacecraft, which was a prototype orbital weapons platform designed to destroy satellites using a massive carbon dioxide laser. The Polyus never made it to orbit, after a software error led to its orbital insertion burn being performed at the wrong altitude, resulting in the payload re-entering the atmosphere before it was able to complete an orbit. The energy would only be used for one other flight, the aforementioned Buran shuttle launch, which by all accounts went well. The Energia, though, was never used again, though as of 2016, there have been attempts to revive the vehicle. Perhaps watch this space. Space? Is that a pun? Uh, uh, whatever. On the 16th of May, the Soviet Union successfully landed Venera 5 on Venus. This was the second time they had achieved this feat after landing the Venera 4 successfully about two years earlier. Venera 5 successfully returned atmospheric data before being crushed by pressure about 26 kilometers from the Venusian surface. It wouldn't be until Venera 7 that we'd get transmissions of a probe from the actual surface of the planet. The final anniversary of the week also takes place on the 16th of May and took place in 2011. This was STS-134 and was the 25th and final flight for Space Shuttle Endeavour. The shuttle program was ended one launch later and Endeavour was retired to the California Space Center where it remains in a temporary structure while we wait for a permanent home for the shuttle to be built. And that's it. Wow, slow start to the week and then suddenly the 15th of May was loaded with anniversaries. But that's it now, that's everything, so... Thank you all so much for watching another episode of Space This Week. What a week it was, SN15 absolutely smashed it. Although not literally of course, I guess it absolutely tapped it very gently and then remained stationary, but then I guess that doesn't really have the same ring to it, does it? I can't wait to see what SN16 has in store for us, although I'm slightly worried about the little trend we're seeing here. SN8 good, SN9 bad. 
SN10 good, SN11 bad, SN15 good, SN16 hopefully not bad but also good? All remains to be seen, and with SN15's successor pretty much fully assembled, hopefully we won't have to wait too long to watch SN16 take flight. Rolling past your eyes on screen is a list of all my fantastic Patreon supporters who really helped make this show possible. We also have to give a big shout out to the Lounge Squad, members of my channel who occasionally get early access to videos, unique member badges by their names when they comment, and custom emojis. I'm sure you'll spot them in the comments below. If you want to join their ranks, you can hit the join button below the video. Also, there are two more videos on screen as well if you want to check those out. Other than that, goodbye! <laughs>